Um, I've seen a lot of ASMR book reading videos, um, and I never got around to doing it, doing one of my own, and I have some free time tonight, so I thought I might read a little bit of one of my favorite series of all time. Lord of the Rings. In fact, I love it so much, I have a tattoo of the Tree of Gondor on my back. Uh, for my birthday this year, my best friend gave me the wire. Well, I have the one ring, it's like an actual ring, but she gave one to me on a necklace. out of time if you can hear some weird background noises. I have a hamster right now. Well, I've had him for a while, but he can be pretty loud. I put a blanket over his cage to sort of dampen the noise, but it's not really going to do too much. And then, uh, before I started, I actually kind of wanted to start doing book recommendations. Um, All God's Children. I am read this book for my chronology class, and it's extremely interesting. It's a very good read. Um, it's a bit violent for, for an ASMR video, but it's about um, Lily Boskett and the family for him, like his dad and his grandfather, and they have an extremely strong history of violence, and Willie Boskett actually murdered a few people on a subway. So that story is about how he came to be, and a lot of it's about his father, too, who is really interesting. Willie is actually still in prison today in New York. So, really good book. I recommend it. Especially if you're interested in criminology. When Mr. Bilbo Baggins of Bag End announced that he would shortly be celebrating his 111st birthday with a party of special magnificence, there was very much talk and excitement in Abaddon. Bilbo was very rich and very peculiar, and he had been the wanderer of the Shire for 60 years, ever since his remarkable disappearance from in an unexpected return. The riches he had brought back from his travels had now become a local legend, and it was popularly believed whatever the old folk might say, that the hill at Big End was full of tunnels stuffed with treasure. And if it was not enough for fame, there was 
has also his prolonged vigor to marvel at. Time worn, worn on, time wore on, but it seemed to have little effect on Mr. Baggins. At ninety, he was much the same as fifty. At ninety-nine, they became to call him well preserved, but unchanged would have been nearer the mark. There were some things that shook. There were some that shook their heads and thought that this was too much for good. It seemed unfair that anyone should possess apparently perpetual youth as well as reputedly inexhaustible wealth. It will have to be paid for, they said. It isn't natural, and trouble will come of it. But so far, trouble had not come. As Mr. Baggins was generous with his money, most people were willing to forgive him from his oddities and his good fortune. He remained on visiting terms with his relatives, except, of course, the Sackville Bagginses. eldest of these, and Bilbo's favorite, was young Frodo Baggins. When Bilbo was ninety-nine, he adopted Frodo as his heir and brought him to live at Bag End, and the hopes of the Sackville Bagginses were finally dashed. Bilbo and Frodo happened to have the same birthday, September 22nd. You had better come and live here, Frodo, my lad, said Bilbo one day, and then we can celebrate our birthday parties comfortably together. And that time Frodo was still in his tweens, as the hobbits called the irresponsible twenties between childhood and coming of age at thirty-three. Twelve more years had passed. Each year the Bagginses had given very lively combined birthday parties at Big End, but now it was understood that something quite exceptional was being planned for that autumn. Bilbo was going to be eleven-one, one hundred eleven, a rather curious number, and a very respectable age for the hobbit. The old Took himself had only reached 130, and Bilbo was going to be 33. 33, an important number, the date of his coming of age. Tongues began to wag in Havaton and Bywater. The rumor of the coming event traveled all over the Shire. The history and character of Mr. Bilbo Baggins became once again the chief topic of conversation, and the older folks suddenly found the reminiscences of welcome demand. No one had a more attentive audience than old Ham Gamgee, commonly known as the Gaffer. He held forth at the Ivy Bush, a small inn on the Bywater Road, and he spoke with some authority, helped old Holman in the same job before that. Now that he was himself growing old and stiff in the joints, the job was mainly carried on by his youngest son, Sam Gamgee. Both father and son were on very friendly terms with Bilbo and Frodo. They lived on the hill itself, in number three bag shot row, just below Big End. A very nice, well spoken, gentle hobbit is Mr. Bilbo, as I've always said, the gaffer declared, with perfect truth, for Bilbo was very polite to him, calling him Master Hamfest and consulting him constantly upon the growing of vegetables. In the matter of roots, especially potatoes, the gaffer was recognized as the leading authority by all the neighborhood, including himself. But what about this Frodo that lives with him? asked Old Noakes of Bywater. Baggins is his name, but he's more than half a brandy buck, they say. It beats me why any Baggins or a Hobbiton would go should go looking for a wife away there in Buckland, where folks are so queer. And no wonder they're so queer, put in Daddy Twofoot, the gaffer's next door neighbor. If they live on the wrong side of the Brandywine River, and right again on the old forest, that's a dark, bad place if the tales be true. You're right, Dad, said the gaffer. Not that the brandy books of Buckland live in the old forest, but they're a queer breed, seemingly. They fool about with boats on that big river, and that isn't natural. Small wonder that the trouble came of it, I say. This Frodo is a nice young hobbit, as you could wish to meet. Very like, very much like Mr. Bilbo, and more than looks. After all, his father was a Baggins. A decent, respectable hobbit was Mr. Drogo Baggins. There was never much to tell of him until he was drowned. Drowned, said several voices. They had heard this and other darker rumors before, of course, but hobbits have a passion for family history, and they were ready to hear it again. Well, so as they say, said the gaffer. You see, Mr. Drogo, he married poor Miss Primula Brandybuck. She was our Mr. Bilbo's first cousin on the mother's side, her mother being the youngest of the old Took daughters. And Mr. Drogo was his second cousin. 
So Mr. Frodo is his first and second cousin. Once removed, either way, as the saying is, if you follow me, and Mr. Drogo was staying at Brandy Hall with his father-in-law, old Master Gorbadoc, as he often did after his marriage, him being partial to his vittles, the old Gorbadoc keeping a mighty generous table. And he went out boating on the Brandywine River, and he and his wife were drowned, and poor Mr. Frodo, only a child and all. I have heard they went on the water after dinner in the moonlight, said old Noakes, and it was Drogo's weight as he sunk the boat. And I heard she pushed him in, and he pulled her in after him, said Sandy Man, the Hobbiton Miller. You shouldn't listen to all you hear, Sandy Man, said the gaffer, who did not much like the miller. There is no call to go talking of pushing and pulling, but are quite tricky enough for those that still sit still without looking further for the cause of trouble. Anyway, there was this Mr. Frodo left an orphan and stranded, as you might say, among those queer bucklanders being brought, bu being brought up anyhow in Brandy Hall. A regular warren by all accounts. Old Master Gorbanock never had fewer than a couple of hundred relations in the place. Mr. Bipple never did a kinder deed than when he brought the lad back to live among the decent folk. Decent folk. But I reckon it was a nasty knock for those Saxville Bagginses. They thought they were going to get to Bag End that time when he went off, and they thought he would be dead. And then he comes back and orders them off, and he goes on living and living and never looking a day older, bless him. And suddenly he produces an heir and has all the papers made out proper. The Saxville Bagginses won't ever see the inside of Bag End now, or it is to be hoped not. There is a tidy bit of money tucked away up there, I hear tell, said a stranger, a visitor on business, from Mitchell Delving in the west farthing. All the top of your hill is full of tunnels packed with chests of gold and silver and jewels, by what I've heard. Then you've heard more than I can speak to, answered the gaffer. You know nothing about jewels. Mr. Bilbo is free with his money, and there seems to be no lack of it. But I know of no tunnel making. I saw Mr. Bilbo when he came back a matter of sixty years ago when I was a lad. I had not long come to prentice to old Holman, him being my dad's cousin. But he had me up at Big End, helping him to keep folks from trampling and trespassing all over the garden while the sale was on. In the middle of it all, Mr. Bilbo comes up the hill with a pony and some mighty big bags and a couple of chests. I don't doubt they were mostly full of treasure he had picked up in foreign parts with the mountains of gold... Where there be mountains of gold, they say, but there wasn't enough to fill tunnels. But my lad Sam will know more about that. He's in and out of bank, and crazy about stories of the old days, he is. And he listens to all Mr. Bilbo's tales. Mr. Bilbo has learned him his letters, meaning no harm, mark you, and I hope no harm will come of it. Elves and dragons, I says to him. Cabbages and potatoes are better for me and you. Don't go getting mixed up in the business of your banners, or you'll land in trouble too big for you, I says to him. And I might be it to others, he added with a look at the stranger and the miller. But the gaffer did not convince his audience. The legend of Bilbo's wealth was now too firmly fixed in the minds of the younger generation of hobbits. Ah, but he has likely enough been adding to what he brought at first, argued the miller, voicing common opinion. He's often away from home. And look at that outlandish folk that visit him, dwarves coming at night, and that old wandering conjurer again off and all. You can say what you like, Gaffer, but Big End's a queer place, and all its folks are queerer. And you can say what you like, about what you know no more of than you do of voting, Mr. Sandyman retorted the Gaffer, disliking the Miller even more than usual. If that's being queer, then we should we could do with a bit more queerness in these parts. There's some not far away that wouldn't offer a pint of beer to a friend if they lived in a hole with golden walls, but they do things proper at Big End. Our Sam says that everyone's going to be invited to that party. And there's going to be presents, Mark, you presents for all. This very month, as is, 